Hey, hello, hello, and welcome everyone. I always uh, have to say like, good morning, good afternoon, good night, good in the middle of the night, depending on from where you are at. But thank you so much for joining us for, it's actually kind of like a special edition. There was an extra week in this month. So you have you have extra Liz and I. So hopefully that is a good thing in your life. But uh, Liz McInvale and I are here. We're both clinicians with OCD. Um, so we kind of give you a clinical perspective as well as some insight from how we did so well in treatment and are able to, to give back to the community. So we're really excited for today's uh, live stream. It is another edition of Ask the Experts. And so what this live stream is really about is it gives you, the community, an opportunity to ask any questions that you have wanted to know. Maybe you're watching different live streams and a topic came up and you're curious about it. Or maybe there's some uh, thing that you kind of hit a wall in your treatment and you're curious about a question or you want to share or connect with other people in the community, that's really what this live stream is all about. So we welcome you today, uh, Wednesday, March 30th. We are super excited to have you. So a couple announcements just before we get into the questions. We also, as always, get pre-submitted questions. So if you want to submit a pre-submitted question, the main way to do that is on iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind. So if you go there, there's so many ways that you can connect with us. And that's one of the main ways that we love to hear from you. So you can ask a question there, you can suggest a topic. So that's kind of like a platform for you to really connect with the live streams, any of the live streams that the IOCDF offers. So definitely check that out. That's a great way to ask questions, interact with us. Also, don't uh, forget, you can go to iocdf.org forward slash live and right there gives you all the different viewing options. You can even watch it live there, I found out once. So definitely check that out. So those are ways that you can connect with us. But if you're watching live now and want to ask a question, you didn't get a chance to submit a pre-submitted question, definitely go ahead on whatever platform you're at, type in a question and we'll make sure to get to that um, if we have time. So a couple things just to remember, this live stream is for educational uh, purposes only. It's not intended to replace therapy. So for treatment related questions, please work with your provider or contact a local clinician. You can at, use the IOCDF's online resource at iocdf.org forward slash find dash help to locate a trained clinician near you. The IOCDF is also not a, a crisis hotline. So if you're in a crisis or you are ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911 or the suicide prevention hotline at 800-273-8255. We want to create as safe of a space as possible. So please be kind and respectful to everyone. This is being broadcast on several social media platforms and is being recorded. So please be mindful of this as you ask personal questions or leave comments. At the end of the day, we are all here to support one another. Uh, some really cool things. The IOCF's Faith and OCD Conference is happening May 9th. The, this conference is for faith members, faith leaders, and mental health professionals. So get more info and register at iocdf.org forward slash faith conference. Also, registration is open for the 27th annual OCD conference taking place in Denver this July. We're so excited to be back. It's been two years. Liz and I will be there. We're excited to meet you. Uh, so this is one of a kind of event that brings together the entire OCD and related disorders community, including individuals, family and supporters, therapists and researchers. So learn more and register at iocdf.org forward slash OCDCon. And then Tuesday, April 5th, tune in for a new town hall at 7 p.m. Eastern time. It's in collaboration with the Pandas Network, the Pandas uh, Physicians Network, rather. So visit iocdf.org forward slash live for more information. So Ooh. many updates. Ooh. Do you need Ooh. a breather in a water? I know. <laughs> Serious. How are you feeling about the conference coming up? Oh, I'm so excited. I am. Um, it's like this, like anxious anticipation because like, you know, it's like, it's real. Like, it, you know, there's this piece that you're like, is it real? Are we really going to see people in real, like I can hug you and I can I see you in real life. So I'm excited. And, you know, um, we just got submissions and they started to get uh, acceptances out this week and the schedule should be posted soon. So I'm just super excited because it's such a fun conference and opportunity to really connect with the community that for many of us just means so much to us. And for those of you who haven't attended, the conference is one of a kind. It's not like you think of just this like academic conference that you go to and it's super boring. It's a conference where you learn, you engage, you get to hear from speakers with lived experiences, um, you name it. But also you get to connect and you get to build an OCD community. And many of us, Chris, myself, Ethan, we've built our community through the IOCDF platform and through the conference. What are, what are you feeling and, and how are you thinking about it, Chris? Well, I'm so excited. I was really thinking about the last time that you and I talked face to face was when Tommy received his 
um, Hero Award. And I remember we, you were like saying hi to Tommy and we were talking, that was 2019. And then I haven't seen you in person since. So it's weird because I've seen you more than like a lot of people in my life because of the live streams and because of like the meetings and stuff. But like physically, it's just crazy for me to think that it's been so long. So it's going to be strange. It's going to be weird. It's been too long. I'm excited to see you. Excited to see everybody. But yeah, I mean, you said it right. I think what's so great about these conferences, or at least how I feel, it's like the one place that I feel understood. I'm lucky enough now to obviously have family and loved ones that support me. There's just a different feeling, though, being in a room and being in a building surrounded by people that get it. And it's almost like you don't have to explain yourself. You're like, oh, they all go through what I go through. So I'm excited. Me too. Me too. So let's hop in. So today I'm going to give us the task um, that we're never, we have yet to be capable of achieving, but we're going to try of just kind of doing these rapid fire, rapid fire questions. So we have a bazillion questions that were pre-submitted or that have been asked at different conferences that we, um, different conferences, <laughs> we're talking about conferences, different live streams um, that need to be addressed that we really, I want us to hop into. So I was thinking we are just going to get going and see if each of us can just answer and try to do it in a minute or less so that we can get through as many as possible. But what that doesn't mean is that this isn't going to be engaging and educational for those of you that didn't submit a question. Our goal is that these questions will be applicable to you. Um, but also, if you have other questions, please post them live so that Chris and I can be addressing them. And we can actually start with the first live question. It's from Jacqueline at 1107 My Time. Waiting lists for decent psychiatric care in Australia are long. While many psychologists won't take patients with OCD as they're deemed difficult to treat, can you please comment on this? Yeah, you know, I, did, I went to actually a therapist like in-person event in early 2020. And when people asked what I treated and I said OCD, everybody, because most of them were just general therapists treating other stuff. They said, does anybody with OCD ever get better? We feel like every time they come in, we talk with them, we have a good game plan and they come the next week. And it's almost like they they didn't even hear me last week and, and had short term memory because they keep bringing up the same stuff and we feel frustrated. So I think, unfortunately, when somebody's not trained in OCD care, it does feel very difficult to treat. Obviously, with Liz and I, we love treating OCD. We've been trained excruciatingly um, years and how to treat it. So to us, we know that even though it's a challenge, it can be done. I, I know there was another question um, submitted live stream so we can do one, hit both, uh, both of the questions. This other person's actually in Australia as well. Um, one thing that I would suggest is if you find in Australia, because I've heard this from other people in Australia, that there isn't treatment there. Somebody asked, can somebody come out to an American clinic? If you find, um, Jacqueline, that nobody in your country, continent, um, can, can treat it, I would suggest seeing if you could get treatment elsewhere. Like, obviously, that's, that's going to be a financial strain. And I have all the, you know, sympathy in the world for that. But if you find that it's too difficult, I would say absolutely see if you can find care in America and in the UK, other places. Um, the good thing is with the IOCDF, I mean, one of our missions is to continue to train. And that could be something that we could kind of pass along that there's not a lot of care in Australia and see if we could do like a BTTI international or a training out there. Um, because it's so sad that it's difficult. But yeah, unfortunately, for people that don't specialize in this treatment, they feel like OCD is too much of a challenge because of the extreme anxiety and the kind of like cyclical nature of the disorder. Yeah, I do know that if you go to IOCDF.org, there are some resources for Australian providers. And then I do know that there are some providers we've worked with who've trained folks in Australia. And then in addition, the other thing I'll say is consider self-help websites and consider some of the incredible self-help books and workbooks, because those, those can be an adjunct. Um, so in addition to treatment or could supplement treatment, if there isn't another option, it's certainly better than nothing. Uh, when my OCD kicks in, I get really stressed and I have a knot in my stomach. Um, and, and this makes sense, right? This is anxiety that you're talking about, Costas. And what we find is that it definitely impacts sleep and different things. But what we hope is that with appropriate treatment, you will start to see reductions in your anxiety. From Gentil at 11.09, my OCD is about hurting people. Whenever I try to text someone, I can't because I'm afraid I'm going to hurt them. This obsession gives me a lot of anxiety. But should I start? Sh so should I start with it to get emotional support? Okay, so I think the question is asking that you're afraid that you're going to uh, hurt. I'm guessing texting them, you're afraid you're going to hurt them emotionally. I'm just guessing because I don't see how you could hurt somebody through a text. But um, should you start to get emotional support? You know, when we talk about values work in OCD, what we're talking about is what 
making a decision out of a, a, a need, a goal, a, a passion, a, you know, a value over fear. And so in that case, you want emotional support. You want to connect with your friends. That's much more important than worrying about fear. So I'd absolutely recommend that you reach out to these people because they can give you support, not reassurance, of course, but support. I will say, remember that with uh, emotional harm OCD, where you're afraid of hurting other people, it makes OCD have you feel like you're all, all powerful and you could totally crush everyone. They're adults. They can handle it themselves. Take the risk. Take that. Um, live in that uncertainty and really start connecting with the people around you. They want to hear from you. Absolutely. I'm going to jump back to Australia because we had a pre-submitted question that I want to answer. It was, I live in Australia and there's one, there's only one treatment facility in the Southern hemisphere. The facility costs about $10,000 for three weeks after exploring options over the last 12 years. I'm also looking abroad, but I'm unsure how much treatment costs in America. Can you give me an idea? Um, so this is a really good question and I, I want to want to share a little bit about it. So the way our system works here is that a lot of our clinics either accept insurance um, or they will do self-pay options. And then many of the self-pay, you still have an option to submit for insurance reimbursement. My assumption would be that Australian-based insurance wouldn't work in America. So you'd probably be paying the self-pay rate. Um, I would say the self-pay rate ranges from about $650 to $1,000 a day for a residential level of care for OCD. Um, maybe more than that as well, different programs. But I would say that's probably the average. So $10,000 for three weeks is probably less expensive than what you're going to find in the U.S. Um, but, you know, definitely look into all of the options. There are some programs that might have some scholarship options as well. 100% American-based facilities take international patients all the time. So um, we here at McLean Houston have patients from South America. Um, we've had patients from Israel, you name it. And so that that is something that's accessible and available. Chris, next question. My OCD and anxiety has gotten worse in recent years, and I've stressed about the future. What is the best way to ease our mind when we feel hopeless? Well, one thing I always tell people is OCD really has a difficult time living in the present. It just does. I mean, when it's in the present, OCD doesn't have its power. OCD consistently has us fixate on a mistake or something we did in the past or uh, worrying about the future. And because we can't fix a future issue now, it has us just spin in the moment. And so one of the things that we can do is we can accept that part of the, the, the goal of life is to know that we don't know what's going to happen next and to just trust ourselves that we'll be able to figure things out when we get there. But what you can focus is on the here and now. When people tell me that their OCD and anxiety has gotten worse in recent years, it usually means because somebody isn't getting treatment or at least fighting back against it. I think a lot of people think or proper treatment. Or proper treatment, correct. I think a lot of people think the OCD is going to either just kind of like grow out of it over time or it'll stay manageable. But because with OCD, you're reinforcing the disorder daily, it's going to consistently get worse. And so what I would really um, hope that you could do is like find proper care. I know Liz just talked about some self-help options, books, uh, resources that were put in the chat um, or finding obviously a trained clinician and really starting to work on that. But once again, my, my advice to all my clients that really stress about the future, I tell them, look, let's focus on today, especially if you're still dealing with those anxiety, let's focus on today because where you'll be after treatment, you'll be much better prepared to focus on the future than you are currently. Absolutely. Next question. Um, I have scrupulosity, but now my mind is racing and I'm constantly thinking about my OCD as a whole. It says things like, what should I do? Am I suppressing these thoughts? Am I engaging with them or finding them? And it confuses me. Um, and I do this all day to the point that I can't focus on other, on anything else. What is this and what should I do? So I think overall the question is like, I have scrupulosity, but I'm also stuck in this rumination cycle. And the rumination cycle is asking all these questions that get us down this path of trying to search for certainty. How do they address it? Yeah. So they asked, um, Ah, she has to leave the question. Um, yeah, so they were asking. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. I did that. <laughs> I was like trying to read it. Um, yeah, so what, one thing that I, I saw from the question with scrupulosity is like how to address these rumination thoughts. Should I suppress them? Should I this? Should I that? 
one of the things that um, I, I forget which clinician early on when I was getting trained talked about it, but the, the thing that most of us think when we go into treatment, so let's say with group velocity, is you're having all these intrusive thoughts about faith, about religion, going to hell, angering God. And so our relationship with OCD thoughts coming in is we think every thought we have, we need to, to listen to, we need to engage with, we need to do whatever it says. But what you learn in treatment is you change your relationship with your thought. You're not trying to get rid of thoughts, ignore them, et cetera. That doesn't work. But what you're recognizing is I have intrusive thoughts. Unfortunately, that's part of the condition. The strength that I have is how I respond to them. So if, you know, if I was dealing with scrupulosity and, you know, I felt like God was angry and I had to do prayer for three hours in order to reverse that, obviously I would choose not to do the prayer. But that doesn't mean the intrusive thoughts is going to vanish. The intrusive thoughts are going to consistently say, look, you're going to go to hell because you haven't prayed. Once again, we always talk about that uncertainty, but what I'm really going to do with that intrusive thought is tolerate the fact that it's going to be there and recognize that I don't have to engage with it. You know, so we don't know, right? That's faith. We don't know exactly what's going to happen after we pass, but that's part of the treatment is not trying to stop something. I always tell people with intrusive thoughts, you have to take a more passive approach than active. When you get really fixated in your head for hours, you're validating those thoughts and you're creating the louder experience. And so if I have intrusive thoughts about a topic like mine specifically about hurting a family member, what I had to do is let them be present and tolerate the fact that I'm going to consistently have these thoughts every day and I'm going to just not engage with them and tolerate the fact that they're going to be there. And then, of course, I spent more time with those family members, let the thoughts get louder. But because I didn't reinforce them, they started to fade. And the thing I'll, I'll, I'll just add on to is remember the more we engage with our fear or our thoughts, the bigger it gets, right? The only way to allow our fear to get smaller, right? To allow our OCD triggers to not be triggers is actually by not engaging. And so what Chris is saying is that OCD is going to pull you into trying to find certainty um, and to try to get you stuck in this loop. And the second you start going down that rabbit hole, you get stuck. And that makes sense why it's hard to focus all day because you're stuck in that trap. Our goal of treatment is actually that we don't try to suppress the thoughts and the fact that they're there or ignore them or distract ourselves because then they keep popping up, right? We're kind of playing this game. It's that we acknowledge them and we move on, right? We acknowledge them, accept them. Okay. Like I'm having these thoughts or I, I have the urge to, to understand this, but like I'm choosing not to, right? Choose not to solve. Solving for OCD always gets us stuck. And that's actually where freedom exists. During my childhood, I developed what I call anxious tics. My experience involved a lot of checking and counting, blinking my eyes over and over, and most recently cracking my joints. I've come to associate these anxious tics with OCD, but I've never found anyone who understands it or has treatment for them. It's not involuntary that I'm making these movements, though sometimes they do become automatic. I've been unable to find much information on these issues and if they are connected to OCD. Their repetitive nature is what connects them to OCD for me. I'm looking for relief, but the cracking becomes a compulsion that I have to keep repeating. I don't know if you've ever seen this type of obsessive body movements or if you might have some suggestions for treatment. Yeah, what I want to say first is I'm glad that you could recognize the difference between voluntary and involuntary. I think sometimes people get diagnosed with Tourette's or some other neurological disorder and think that they can't control them. So a lot of times what I've seen clients with like tics like that, like it could be, you know, knuckle cracking, it could be other like head movements and stuff. For a lot of them, it's like a quick movement movement, and it's associated re with relief. So if they're having an intrusive thought and they start to, to move like that, or it can be any kind of joint. And so what I've worked, you know, and I, I, what, what I've worked on it when it's not, like I said, like a, a neurological tick that you can't control is one thing that I try to see is like, how long can you resist giving into the urge? Obviously, um, the other thing that can help sometimes is being aware. You were saying in the question that sometimes you don't even recognize you do it, it just becomes automatic. So notice, are you doing it when you're bored? Are you doing it when you're stressed? Are you doing it when you're watching TV? Like start to notice when you're doing that. And the goal is try to reduce the length in between and try to push them out until you get to a point that it becomes more voluntary. And so a lot of clients will like 
crack things and stuff like that. And obviously people without OCD do it, but they want to get rid of it because it becomes such a tick. And so what you're trying to do in that moment is see if you can elongate the period, tolerate the discomfort. Usually it, there's not a worry associated with it. For most people, it's just all their focus comes on doing that tick and it's hard to pay attention. So it's trying to let yourself go through that discomfort, engage in something else and try to see how long you can go without consistently ticking. I, I do believe we had a talk on this. And so um, we will try to post it if we can find it. Cause I was trying to look on the YouTube channel, but I know that we did one for sure on blinking um, or where blinking was addressed, or maybe it was a recent newsletter, but a hundred percent we've seen this, right. And this is a common manifestation of compulsions at, and treatment works. And so I want to remind, remind you of that. I would encourage you to find a provider who specializes in OCD and BFRBs um, because they may have a little bit more experience um, BFRBs, ticks and, and that sort of thing as well. All right. Chris, how do I seek support when I'm stuck in OCD and rumination? We actually just talked about this, but but we'll go back into it again. It often feels that it feels like those I turn to su for support get overwhelmed by my rumination that they cut me off and I feel unsafe or isolated. I don't know how to balance this and where to go for help in times of an emergency. Yeah. So a lot of times people around you do get frustrated because they don't understand OCD. So when somebody's ruminating and bringing up a similar topic every time, people who don't get OCD get very frustrated. So one thing I would say to work on is what kind of support do you need that isn't going to increase the OCD? So if that support is enabling, reassurance, seeking, confessing, that's probably not the best support. What I'm guessing, though, is people aren't doing it with a loving tone. They're probably very frustrated and it feels very cold and dismissive. Remember to separate yourself from the disorder. So recognizing that loved ones are frustrated with the disorder, not you, but have that talk with them and say, look, like I recognize I shouldn't be seeking out, um, you know, reassurance, et cetera. But I would like this kind of support. That's why support groups are really great as well, because you can be in a room with other people that get it. When you're stuck in rumination, remember the brain is trying to figure something out. It's trying to solve something. It's trying to almost replay the incident to feel good. And you have to recognize that that's an active behavior, just like hand washing and checking. It's much easier to do, obviously, because you don't have to move or do something in, in public, but you have to choose to tune out the rest of the world and be focused on your head. And so with rumination, what you're going to work on is letting that problem be unsolved. Let that memory be unclear, whatever the, the, the feared outcome is, and tolerate not actively approaching that and instead engaging forward, which means you're going to have to tolerate the fact that whatever you're ruminating on won't have a solution that you create. I want to add two quick things. The treatment for OCD is actually like we are teaching you to tolerate distress, not get rid of the distress. And I think a lot of times people think, OK, I have to fix the distress. And so the way my family members are going to support me is by engaging in this rumination cycle. You're right. They get frustrated because actually what we know is that that's not really actually helpful support. That actually just increases symptoms and becomes enabling behavior. Right. And so the way they could support you is could we go on a walk or could we could we go do something meaningful? Right. So you lean into the uncertainty, you lean into the distress and you go do a valued activity engaging in rituals with someone is not supportive and it doesn't feel supportive for them. And it actually isn't supportive for you either. Although in that moment, it feels like it. If responses or anything happens where you're feeling unsafe in times of an emergency, we want you to go to your local emergency room, call 911 or call the suicide prevention line. Safety is number one and keeping yourself safe is the most important thing. And so if your safety is ever at risk or in question, we want you to do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Do you want me to jump in? Yes, I, let's jump the, in. The next live question comes from Andrea at 12, 13 year time, Skyla. If someone is only one month into treatment and is having trouble fully engaging in the ERP, they're trying to do so. They may be a little inconsistent. Do you warn them about letting them go if they're not ready or do you help them to get ready? This is a great question. And I think for me, I want to just start with saying it really depends um, because one of the things I constantly want to be thinking about is is the treatment that we offer the right treatment for you right now, right? It's important for as clinicians that we're always thinking about this and that at day one, we're, we're assessing like, are you ready for this type of treatment? And is this the right fit right now? Or would it be better suited after you do some other work? Now, 
I would not, if someone is trying, I am not letting you go, right? Because that means you're trying. But what I am going to do is I'm going to step back and say, okay, do we need to adjust? right? So maybe we need to work on lower level exposures. Maybe we actually need to spend more time on psychoeducation and helping you understand ERP and what it looks like so that there is more buy-in, right? It is not good on session one or two to jump into ERP if a patient isn't bought into the ERP process. However, if I find a couple months in, a patient is trying to negotiate with me in the sense of like, okay, Liz, I'll do these exposures, but I'm not willing to do the response prevention, or I'll do these exposures, but I'm not going, I'm going to go avoid later. Then I am going to say, okay, so then is my model and in, in the treatment that I offer that I know can be effective for OCD, is it going to work for you? Because what I wouldn't want to do is ERP treatment doesn't work if we do it halfway, right? So if we do exposures, but we don't do response prevention, we're not going to get better. We're going to feed our OCD and feed the cycle. And so I think it really depends, but I would want to spend time doing readiness and see if there's lower level exposures that we can do with consistency. The thing I will say is that if you're doing exposures, but you're not willing to do any of them without response prevention, what the clinician may be saying or thinking is, well, then this treatment isn't going to work. And that is true. And so, but that's where it's important to say, okay, well then are there exposures that we're, you are willing to do with full response prevention so that we can help grow your skills and your, your willingness to then move on to higher level ones. I wanted to jump real quick. It's, it's a quick answer question and answer um, for the uh, live question. So uh, Jelena asks at 1215, is there a link between OCD and smoking cannabis or can it help? I don't know if everyone can access, but there's a really good article that was written on this in the summer 2020 newsletter. So it's volume 34, number two. Um, there was a research article about that by uh, Riley R. Kaiser, MD. Um, so I think, I, I mean, Liz, you could totally cut me off if you don't agree, but I think Liz and I are probably not the best to talk about that. I mean, obviously we see what works with our clients, but I always like evidence-based um, facts. And so I know that in two newsletters, the one I just mentioned, and then I believe it was another 2020 newsletter, and it was a study done by Patrick McGrath, and he actually did a talk about it at one of the conferences about research on that. So I always suggest that, you know, you talk to your, your MD um, specifically, or maybe even whoever prescribes your medication, or maybe your therapist, because it is such a, a you know, kind of murky area. So I would, I would look at the research. I don't know, because I get this question all the time. And that's usually what I point them to is the research, talk to your MD, like make your own decision, because I feel like it's not something I should, should suggest. Yeah. And I think the thing I always say is I have not yet heard um, of cannabis as being an evidence-based intervention for OCD. And so um, I kind of will leave it at that and encourage you to do your work and talk to substance use providers who are better equipped. Um, I have seen cannabis negatively impact OCD and OCD treatment for people. For sure. Um, absolutely. Do not give up on ERP. It's tough, but it is so worth it. So you want to move to Amy's question at... 1217. Yes. All of so, our times are different. You're in. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it's always, I always look at the last part of the question. Ah, yes. question. Um, our daughter has been uh, suffering. This is Amy Upton. Uh, our daughter has been suffering with OCD since elementary year. She's married with two kids under two. Postpartum depression seems to have majorly challenged her depression and thus OCD. Any advice on this particular challenge? I'm definitely going to hand this over to Liz because she is who I look to for any answers around perinatal OCD. Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And we actually are working on an entire website section of this um, at iocdf.org within our website because it's really important that we're talking about the impact um, of mental health, of depression, but also the way OCD may fluctuate or may be impacted in the perinatal period. So pregnancy all the way to postpartum. What we know is that we're at higher risk during these times when hormones have increased, stress has increased, we're on little, going on little, little sleep, our vulnerabilities are up, right? You name it. And so it makes sense for us to see an increase in mental health symptoms, especially for those of us who had a previous mental health diagnosis, right? So for those of us like myself, when I 
have OCD, I knew that the perinatal period, or I know that the perinatal period it is a little bit higher risk for me in terms of the way my OCD or my mental health may be impacted. The great news is that treatment works. There is incredible, amazing treatment. ERP still works, and there are medication options that are safe that you can talk to your psychiatrist about to kind of work out what makes, what makes the most sense. But we do and are able to provide kind of comprehensive, targeted treatment for individuals who are in this period and in this time. There are specialists. So here in Houston, I could name a couple different people that really specialize in OCD during the perinatal period. And there's also a lot of different research in that arena. But what I will say is my biggest advice is get with a clinician who's specialty train, who has specialty training in OCD and depression and see if there's somebody who may also fit a, a perinatal specialty in the sense that is there somebody who either would be a good fit um, or somebody who does have some background and has worked at women's clinics or or in psychology departments um, with individuals in the perinatal period. Amazing. All right. We have a question from Bettina at 1220. My OCD told me not to do an exposure. An awful thing will happen to my mother in the future. But it also told me that if I didn't do it, another bad thing will happen to her. So this is something that happens all the time with OCD, right? That's why we can't trust it. It provides us with impossible decisions. If we do the exposure, a big one I see, for instance, is people with STI fears or health conditions. They don't want to go to the doctors because they're afraid it's yep. going to get confirmed but they have to, they want to go to the doctors because the uncertainty is killing them. So usually if somebody is challenged with both of these things, like your question, Bettina, what I suggest is we got to figure out a way to do an exposure around both parts. And so usually the best thing to do is to make that doctor's appointment or, you know, do that exposure, but a little bit down the road. And the reason for that is let's say going back to like me having uh, wanting to go to doctors for a health condition. If I make an appointment in May, I'm going to have to sit with uncertainty for a month of not getting the answer. And that's going to be challenging to the OCD. And then when I go to the doctor's appointment, now that's going to be challenging to OCD because then I'm going to get labs and have to wait. So it's kind of beating OCD at its game. But the biggest thing I want you to remember is that that's why we can't trust OCD. Because look, Bettina, it put you in an impossible position. It's like, do it, don't do it, et cetera. So also always make sure that the motive behind any choice that you make is for your well-being and not for the OCD. So I hope you did the exposure um, with the intent that I'm going to do it because I want to get better. That's what I would say. That's right. Um, yes, other people are sharing some of their their thoughts and, and what to do, what not to do. Let's move to Gandek at 1121 my time. How do I challenge the perfectionism rules that OCD has created for me? I feel like it's so reinforced and it does help me feel better if I follow them. But perfection for me is actually ego dystonic. Well, perfectionism, it feels good to do because we're going to be perfect. Why not do the best if we have an opportunity to do the best? But what you're probably recognizing, Gandek, is that it doesn't allow us to accomplish anything. Perfectionism actually leads to a lot of procrastination, a lot of incomplete things. And once again, OCD is all about specific rituals. So what I like to do with perfectionism and what I did in my own care, is kind of shake things up. So OCD gives you a laundry list of perfectionistic rules. You want to deliberately go out of your way to not do things perfect. And in fact, kind of like push the envelope and do things the opposite the way that it asks you. So an example is like with perfectionism, if I had a new item, I wanted to keep it safe. I put plastic on it, wraps, etc. So when I bought like a new journal, my therapist and I in session like ripped out a page and like scribbled on the front. To the OCD, it was the end of the world. I had to get rid of it. I had to buy a new one. But it was so empowering because it turned around and said, look, I can still use the journal. It's just as good. Or in school, it's writing a good enough paper. I always like what Jonathan Grayson says. It's like, you got to do the second best paper. Or you got to do the second best job because the perfect job is impossible to reach. So don't be fooled, Gandek, that perfectionism is keeping you you know, producing the best, achieving the best, because I'm sure if you took a look at it, that perfectionism has been weighing you down and preventing you from fully achieving the most that you can. So remember, shake it up. Those rules are not your rules. Mess, mess with OCD's rules. And anytime you notice you're doing something in a ritualistic pattern, you got to break that pattern because that's where OCD lives. 
Exactly. And the thing to remember, too, is that even for someone with contamination OCD, those contamination rituals or washing or whatnot do make us feel in the moment like it's helping, right, that we're, we're staying clean or we're staying safe, but they get us further stuck and they reinforce the cycle. And so, again, it's the bigger picture and the bigger values that perfectionism takes you away from that we want to be thinking about, right? And it's not about the goal doesn't mean that you have to be willing to turn in sloppy products, right? But it's can we complete products without OCD interfering, right? Without having to follow OCD's rules and OCD's rituals, which are almost always exhausting. I want to ask you this question because I get this one a lot. It's at 1222 from Gentile. But this question we get a lot. They'll see people, you know, advertise they understand CBT, but not ERP. They don't specialize in that. Can you quickly just talk about the difference and if somebody should change therapists if the person only knows CBT? Yes. Yes, is both, both, yes, I can answer it. And yes, you should change therapists. So <laughs> let's jump in. So um, I remember having an argument at a university that I worked at when one of the questions on one of, one of the exams in the DSM class was how do you treat OCD? And one of the answers was CBT. And I was like, that's not correct. It's ERP specifically CBT alone doesn't work. So here's the deal. CBT is an umbrella, right? It is an umbrella uh, in the sense that it's a theoretical behavioral intervention, right? The concept of CBT is that if we change our behaviors, we will also change our relationship with our fear, with our thoughts, right? Our cognition. So we change the behaviors, change the cognitions. And so it's the umbrella therapy. But under CBT, there's so many incredible evidence-based interventions that work specifically for different disorders. If you're living with PTSD, you're, you should engage in cognitive processing therapy or prolonged exposure, which fall under the CBT umbrella. If you're living with substance use disorders, with eating disorders, right, you're going to do specific CBT interventions. For OCD, it needs to be exposure and response prevention. I always say the quickest way to know if someone has at least a baseline background in treating OCD is when you call the clinic to say, what treatment do you provide? And if they don't say ERP on their own, say, thank you very much. Now, granted, sometimes it's answered by, you know, the phones aren't always answered by clinicians. They're answered by assistants who may not know. So they may need to find out. So give them a minute. But CBT alone, if I am a CBT clinician, but I'm not specialty, specialty trained in ERP, not only am I not going to be able to provide the effective treatment and care that you need, sometimes I actually can be reinforcing OCD. What I mean by that is there's, there's a worksheet that a lot of CBT providers use called a thought challenge worksheet. And this is an incredible, wonderful worksheet for distorted thinking and, and to challenge our thoughts. But it can become a huge reassurance tool for someone with OCD if they're filling out a thought challenge worksheet for every intrusive thought and they're using that as evidence or proof that it's safe or it's okay. And so CBT alone is not the treatment for OCD. It needs to be ERP. Well said. Tracy French asks at 1223, how do you separate yourself from the feelings that OCD brings and it keeps you stuck in rumination? It becomes exhausting and can keep you from living because of your fixating on the thoughts. So the, what I'd love for you to answer, because I think we always talk about thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. I just did a presentation yesterday on OCD and feelings. Yeah. How do you separate yourself from those feelings when it feels so real? Yeah. By, by not trying to separate ourselves from the feelings, right? So what happens is we actually want to allow the feelings to be there. We want to face the feelings and experience them instead of trying to run away from them. When we allow the feelings to actually be present and we acknowledge their presence, but we don't try to do anything to get rid of them, our relationship with our feelings will totally shift and the feelings will become less prominent. The thoughts will have less power and we will be able to easily not fixate. But the reality is, is that the more we're responding every time we're having this kind of these feelings, which are actually like false alarms, the more we're reinforcing that we're in danger, that we need to respond, that something, something is there. And so we separate ourselves by actually not trying to separate ourselves. So it feels crazy but it's really about facing it, right? I always give the example of if you walk into a locker room that smells really, really bad. When you first walk in, you're like, oh, it's disgusting. It smells terrible here. You have two choices. And if you make the choice to leave because it smells, every time you go back into that locker room, you're faced again with that smell. Oh, it smells terrible. How am I gonna, how am I gonna face this? But if you stay in that locker room, right, what happens? And people will say, well, the smell goes away. The smell doesn't go away right? You, you often forget about it. You remember when the next person walks in and Chris is like, Oh, it smells terrible. How are you sitting in here, Liz? And I'm like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't notice it anymore. Right. Because I got used to it. 
because I wasn't running from it. And so what we actually want to do is we want feelings, we want distress to be something that we don't respond to, we don't run from, we acknowledge, and we move forward. And when we do, they don't have power anymore. The, the power gets taken away from them. And so then the more you do it, the less you'll actually have those feelings and experience that intensity. Yes. And I used to run gyms. So locker rooms did stink. They, they do. Really stink. <laughs> <laughs> but you get used to them if you exactly. don't leave, right? Yes. Um, um, I'm going to hop in. So yeah, yeah. Um, at 1126, is DBT helpful for OCD? I can't do exposures yet. Yeah, so we've talked about this before. So DBT definitely isn't a treatment for OCD in the sense of ERP, meaning that it's not how you reduce OCD uh, symptomology. However, with that said, the way that DBT is found helpful is one of the things that everybody has to be ready for doing ERP is that you're going to be emotionally dysregulated. You're put, you've spent so many years creating a system of reducing anxiety through compulsion. So when you're working in treatment, you're going to be reducing those compulsions, which means your anxiety is going to rise. And so if somebody has enough emotional regulation, they can, they can accept some of that discomfort and kind of push through it. They have distress tolerance, amazing. For some people, they just can't. There's also a lot of times when people are, you know, especially like teenagers and uh, sometimes and, and younger kids where they're yelling, they're screaming, they're fighting, they're, they're clawing at their, their siblings because they're touching something they don't want to touch. So DBT really helps with that emotional regulation and gives you tips and tools and, and treatment on how to be able to make sure that you're not all over the place emotionally. So sometimes people might need that as a precursor. And it sounds like that for you, Tracy, is if, if exposures for you are just absolutely too intense and you've been on medication and still they're too intense, DBT can be a step in to help with that emotional dysregulation. But I do want to make it clear that DBT is not the treatment that you're going to do for ERP. I mean, for therapy, that's going to be ERP. That's right. So it, it often, as Chris said, I just want to reemphasize, it's often recommended when needed as a precursor to treatment, but it wouldn't be the only treatment you would do. Absolutely. Um, Bridget, thank you for sharing. I'm sorry. It sounds like you're going through a tough time and uh, we want to send our, our support and our empathy however we can. It sounds like you're struggling with more anxiety. And so Bridget's asking, she's going through a medical diagnosis. What are some ways to make a plan to help lower her anxiety? Yeah. So if you're noticing, Bridget, that your anxiety, I, I'm going to take this from an anxiety tip because obviously with OCD, the plan would be, you know, creating a hierarchy and doing exposures. But it sounds like because of um, getting over a medical um, surgery that you're dealing with a lot of anxiety. So one thing that I always like to work on is lifestyle shift. And this, once again, I want people to hear this for anxiety, not for the OCD treatment, but for generalized anxiety, um, creating creating a lifestyle change. I mean, a lot of times people aren't sleeping well, they're not eating well, they're not taking care of themselves. Addition to that, it's finding like what is something that you enjoy doing to decrease anxiety. You know, you're not um, doing it every single time you're feeling some anxiety, but as a lifestyle shift. So for a lot of people, it can be exercise, it can be connecting with friends, it can be doing a certain hobby. Often, if you're experiencing anxiety, so I'm guessing just from the surgery you recently had and going through breast cancer, which is so difficult. And like Liz said, we give you our, our prayers and our thoughts. Um, you know, when you're finding yourself overwhelmed, a lot of times grounding techniques can help. So really connecting with your five senses. A lot of times people, if they're feeling kind of overwhelmed, um, doing some deep breathing can help as well as like, I like a DBT tool using ice to kind of lower body temperature. I know, um, fans and cool air getting outside. I would say the biggest, biggest suggestion I'd give though, because I, you know, I did a talk, a, a paper on this in undergrad. What it found is people going through cancer and after cancer, a support group of other people with um, the same experience was one of the number one things that helped people be consistent with their treatment, their chemotherapy, but also helped heal. So if you do have access to that, Bridget, I'd say if you could find a support group for other um, people going through breast cancer, that would be my number one suggestion. Absolutely. Day by day, get support and also stay busy. Remember that um, slowing down tends to be not a great place for ruminative thoughts. Uh, Adam, great question we can help with. Uh, I am a clinician and looking to learn more about ERP. Where can I find that? And is there a certification for ERP? So actually, yes, the International OCD Foundation hosts the BTTI, which is the Behavioral Therapy Treatment Institute. It is a three-day specific training for OCD. So it's a three-day intense training followed by consultation sessions that you do after with the trainers. And it is a wonderful way for you to get 
specific expertise in OCD. Good for you for wanting to learn more about how to, how to specifically train and treat those of us living with OCD. Can I just shout out? So OCD Southern California, we're an affiliate of the IOCDF. We are hosting a BTTI in October uh, in Orange County, California. Yay. Yay. Ours is here in Houston in April. So we're, we are Yay. excited. They do fill up. So stay, stay tuned and make sure you sign up for, for them. Um, all right. So lots of different questions, lots of different things. Yes. Tracy hormonal changes can worsen OCD, just like anything. If vulnerabilities are increased, we can certainly see an increase in OCD symptoms. Um, at 1133, Cheryl, are there any inpatient treatment programs for OCD? If not, what's the best option for patients who need that level of care? Why would a program exclude Medicare coverage? So great questions. And um, there are not many inpatient treatment centers for OCD, but there are residential programs for OCD. So um, there's a little bit of a difference in the in the level of care. So residential programs are programs where you do receive, you're able to receive 24 hour support. But the big difference is that while 24 seven support is available in a residential program, this is not a program that's going to take a higher acuity or a patient whose safety is at risk like an inpatient program would. So inpatient programs like hospitals um, are programs where you live there, but they're able to take a higher acuity in terms of safety or medical acuity. Residential programs for OCD don't tend to take that level of acuity, but it is still you live on site in 24 hour support. And there are quite a few places. McLean Boston um, is one of the few that does accept Medicaid, Medicare. So definitely look into their into their program. To answer the question of why do a lot of programs not take insurance in-house and how does that work? It really comes down to reimbursement. It comes down to, are they able to get contracts and reimbursement with the insurers that allow them to operate at the level of care that they want to be able to be able to operate and offer the level of care and treatment that they feel like they need to, to be able to best support their patients. Most programs do have options for reimbursement, but definitely for Medicare coverage, look into McLean Boston. Um, all right. I have a question for us at 1238 from Celeste. It says, I'm struggling with POCD, but my intrusive thoughts are rarely sexual, but I still get groinal response. Right now I'm free from anxiety and stress, but still get the groinal response. What do you think? I think ignore it and move on or, <laughs> or sorry, I shouldn't have said that. See what I mean? I, I was encouraging suppression. I think acknowledge it and move on, right? Like, okay. Like, still getting that response and I'm still going to move on with my day, right? So I don't know that we need to stop and spend a lot of time focusing on it. And I certainly don't want you to stop and try to solve why am I having this and why am I experiencing it? Because again, remember that solving is going to get us stuck. Um, and so instead, let's focus much more on um, acknowledging and moving on because here's what I love you are free from anxiety and you're free from stress, which means that the thoughts don't have the same intensity. That's something that's left. Are you feeding it, right? Are you doing rituals? Are you responding? Are you engaging in like body checking behaviors to kind of see if you're having groinal responses? Is there anything you're doing that might be heightening it? And if so, let's, let's think about that and address that. Well said. We have a question from Jelena at 1239. My OCD is always telling me I don't understand my job to the point I've taken time off sick as it's led to depression. It's messing with my livelihood. Yes. So Jelena, um, I can relate a little bit in the sense that I used to run a gym and they wanted me to understand how the equipment worked and everything like that. I wasn't a trainer. I ran operations, but they kept training me over and over how to run the equipment and it, I was there for like three years and still didn't feel confident enough and never knew it was OCD until later on, you know, becoming a therapist and getting trained. I'm like, oh, my God, that was OCD that whole time. What happens is OCD puts a lot of doubt. It's the doubting disorder for a reason. And so what it did for me and what it's doing for you is it's messing with our confidence. It's telling us that we don't know it. We have to keep focusing. We need to be trained even more. You don't know it. You don't understand it. The mistake that it sounds like we both made is we listened to it. We trusted the OCD and probably, I mean, I don't know your compulsions, but you're probably trying harder, trying harder. I got to figure this out. It's my due diligence. 
Remember, if you're doing that for a motive to get clarity, the more times we try to get clarity in OCD, the less confident we are in our initial experience. And it's like making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Pretty soon we have no confidence in your case in your job. So it's going to sound very backwards. But what you're going to do is you're going to go to work when you're ready. You know, it sounds like you had to take some time off. It's led to some depression. So I'd really work on that with potential medication, behavioral activation and working with a provider that understands depression. And if they understand depression, OCD, it's even better. Mm -hmm. When you are ready to get back to work, what I'd strongly suggest is to do your work and know that while you're doing your work, you're going to get thoughts and feelings that you're not doing it correct and don't understand it. Keep going. I want you to let your company tell you you don't understand the job and offer additional training versus you telling yourself you don't understand and leaving. That's the hardest thing about the disorders. You won't feel confident, but that's okay. Do the job anyways and do your best and let them tell you you're not doing it better. Because what I hypothesized, which ended up happening for me, is when I stopped trying to figure things out and just did my job, that's when I felt confidence once I took the OCD out of it. That is that is right. Um, the last thing I want to say before we go back to some of our pre-submitted questions is I, I love what you said, Beth. So Beth at 1140 said, I talked to my OCD. I say, hey, yes, I hear you. Thanks for stopping by, but I have things to do. I know you're going to hang out, so just take a seat, right? This is perfect. Beth, what you're describing is you're not suppressing it. You're not saying, oh, OCD is here. I have stuff to do. Please don't be here. Please leave me alone, right? You're saying like, oh, great. Like, thanks for being here take a seat. Right. And I love it. Cause there comes a point where a lot of us are like, is that the best you've got? Like that was, that was the best thought you could throw at me really. Like, and those sort of times are when we're at a place where guess what? We are always on the offense and we're not playing defense against OCD. We want to always be ahead of it. And when it feels like we're not because it's throwing crazy things at us, throw crazy right back at it. Absolutely. All right. Next question. Um, so there are some medication questions that have been submitted. We are going to bring on a psychiatrist to address all of those at once. So um, we're skipping through those. But how to see ERP as treatment and how to prevent OCD from using it as a new obsession opportunity? I love this. So what to do, Chris, when OCD latches on to treatment? Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to shout out real quick. Um, OCD SoCal, we're holding a conference on Saturday, April 30th. And one of our presentations from one of our board members is on this very topic. So what happens, because this happens a lot, is someone just kills the game. They do well in treatment. They're doing great. And us as providers are like, go live your life. Yay. And then OCD attacks the treatment. I have to do it right. You say, accept uncertainty. How do I accept? What are the steps of acceptance? Okay, then you're saying, do the opposite. What is the exact opposite? Okay, you know, it's, it's, it's letting the thought just sit there. What does sit there mean? The treatment is, is, is challenging to do. It is very simple in the way that it is. You know, it, it's challenging to do as somebody that's done it. I can say it's really hard to do, but it's a very simple idea of how to challenge the OCD. We're going to do opposite behaviors. We're going to accept uncertainty, re, you know, reduce and then eliminate compulsions. And we're going to be repetitive and, and, and prolonged about it. So a lot of times clients come in and they make the treatment something I've never heard of. And so once again, just like you've done previously, you're going to start to have to own the fact and accept the fact that, hey, I might be tr doing treatment wrong because usually the reason people are doing this is they want to do OCD perfectly. And then I will say, secondly, a lot of times the underlining kind of core fear when I really uh, work with clients to figure it out, what they say is that they're so afraid of OCD coming back. So they want to do OCD perfectly and get rid of OCD 100%. So they never have to deal with it. So they have to do it perfect. And what I explain to them is that's not the goal of OCD treatment. It's to accept uncertainty, to tolerate thoughts, and over time you'll get better. So this idea of having to do it perfectly because you want to eliminate the disorder is actually making uh, the OCD a compulsion. So just like you treated other uh, triggers with ERP, you're going to use the same ERP for this. Treat it as OCD. Um, so the next question was, do you have any advice on how to deal with guilt and shame surrounding OCD compulsions? And we are actually going to put a link that you'll find in the comments because we did, there was an entire, um, I think it was a town hall, but an entire webinar specifically on guilt and shame with OCD. So I want you to watch that because it's important. This is an important piece. And um, Kim Quinlan, who a lot of us love recently did a workbook on self-compassion and OCD. And this is something that's really important for us to make sure we're integrating. What we don't want to do is make, is do so much ERP 
that almost the ERP like increases depression in the sense that, okay, we're focusing on like all these negative outcomes and these worst case scenarios, and we're not engaging in self-compassion. We're not being proud of the work that we're doing. We're not acknowledging the values that this work is bringing us to it. All that work needs to go hand in hand. And so watch that webinar, look at Kim Quinlan's book. And I have to shout out the ISDF conference in fall. Um, I'm going to be with Kim on a panel about this. So go to the conference. Awesome. See, um, how specific do you have to be when identifying the trigger of your anxiety for ERP to be effective? I have general anxiety much of the time, which pops up throughout the day. And sometimes I don't feel like I'm making progress, reducing my anxiety with ERP, possibly because I'm not sure what bothered me. Every day, the state of uncertainty elicits great anxiety. But when addressing this fear in ERP, I've not made much progress. I'm starting to wonder if I haven't been specific enough in the actual trigger. Yeah, what what happens for a lot of people, and it sounds like for this question as well, is especially in the beginning, it's like you get triggered, you have the anxiety, you get triggered, have the anxiety. After living an OC lifestyle for a very long time, which obviously we're trying to help you get out of, there's all the times that you just start to experience anxiety for no reason. There's actually a really good book written by a Stanford um, neurologist. It's it's why do uh, zebras not get ulcers? It's um, uh, Sapolsky is his name, but he talks about, it's a whole book on the, the microbiology of the body and stress and anxiety. And the body just starts to release stress hormones and anxiety throughout the day. Cause it's so used to it. Cause OCD is cyclical, giving it to you all day. And so just like, um, you know, people expect thoughts to be there. Sometimes you're just going to have triggering feelings that don't even have a thought associated with it. And the compulsion that people choose to do then is they try to get rid of the feeling. They try to identify why they have it so they can do something to get rid of it. Just like Liz has said previously in this broadcast, we have to learn to just live with that discomfort, those feelings. Those are temporary experiences that will pass. Somebody made a good point yesterday in the group that I run. They said, when you go to um, a theme park and you're on a roller coaster, you don't expect that that intense excited excitement to last for the next seven years. Just like if you're having a negative experience, you shouldn't expect it to last seven years. That's so right. identify that emotion. It's there. We're experiencing it. And just like um, I forget who was saying it in the in, in the comments, they just put them in the back seat, put that feeling in the back seat and just know it's going to be with you temporarily for a little bit. That's right. Um, OK, we're going <clears> to <throat> excuse me, address this last question. And then we will take a break for today. And Chris and I are going to plan, um, hopefully, to get some time together to pre-record um, answering questions. We have a lot of questions on the back end that we do want to make sure we still answer. And so we're going to do our own kind of Zoom where we record it and it'll be posted and we'll give you guys an update on that. But just to get through questions so we're caught up. So the last question from Bettina for today at 11.55 a.m. Chris, I did the exposure, but it's hard for me to do full response prevention. I'm still scared of this. How do I try my best? to not do them if I feel that I'm not able to fully prevent the response. Yeah. So one thing that, that I know Liz has talked about, um, Alec Pollard talks a lot about it. So when we talk about ERP, the exposure, and then the response prevention, what we really <coughs> encourage people to do is to try to do a small E and a big RP. So what that means is if you are about to do an exposure, but you know you can't do the full response prevention. What is better then is to try to do the exposure on a smaller tip. So an example, I'm gonna give a very generic example. If opening door handles is too hard, and if you do that exposure, you're just gonna to run to the bathroom, wash your hands after. Sure, it's not great you know, to kind of use your sleeve to open the door, but if previously you would stand there and wait for someone else to open it and run in, it might still be an exposure and a challenge for you to use your sleeve because you still feel like your shirt is dirty. And maybe you still, you know, uh, feel anxiety and stuff, but at least you won't go wash your hands. So that's what a little E in an RP is. What tends to happen is people get comfortable opening with their sleeve and then they're like, okay, the next step I could do is like use my pinky and I still won't wash my hands and then eventually my whole hand. So if you can break down that exposure to smaller steps that prevent you from giving into the compulsion, that's going to be your way to do it. Here's what I'll say. And I talk a lot about this. Doing an exposure, but ritualizing is something most people with OCD do before they're in treatment, right? Unless you're totally isolated. If you have to get out of your, your, you know, your office and my doorknob's contaminated and I touch the doorknob, that's an exposure. But if I go wash my hands, I reinforce OCD. And so it's just so critical as Chris is saying for us to recognize that any rituals you do, even one, reinforces all of OCD in the whole cycle. And so it is so much more critical to do small E, big RP, 
than big E and small RP. So we'd rather you do a lower level exposure that you can fully engage in response prevention than the opposite. Think about ways you can tailor that down. So if that doorknob is too much, what if I touch the doorknob with the paper and then you touch the paper? Would you be willing to do that? Um, right. So, so think about kind of those different ways that is there a way to tailor down an exposure if you're like, well, there's no way for me to do it without a ritual. OK, what could you do instead or what could you do differently then? Perfect. We got through all the questions. Woo! Hi, Ma. I need some water. I'm sure you do too, Chris. So <laughs> yes. um, it's so good to see you, Chris. And it is so good to see all of you and to see the engagement that happened today. We are so excited to continue to do our live streams. Remember, IOCDF hosts a live stream every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern time and every Wednesday at noon Eastern. Uh, Wednesdays, you will either see Chris, myself, Kyle King or Dr. John Abramowitz for the research symposium, but you can always go to iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind to learn more about upcoming live streams. And very importantly, that's also where we want you to submit questions or submit topics that you want to get more information on. We want to follow your guidance and your lead versus our own assumptions. So please help us out and participate. As Chris mentioned early on, please make sure you check out iocdf.org and consider registering for the conference. We know both of us, I can speak for Chris and myself, we hope we get to meet you there and see so many of you in person that we've gotten to connect with virtually over the past couple of years. Absolutely. Go to the conference. We want to see you. Come up and say hi. Um, don't forget to like and um, subscribe on whatever platform you're watching on. You can also view the recordings of past live streams on our YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn pages, as well as iocdf.org forward slash live. If you need any additional resources, go to iocdf.org. One thing is I saw another question on CBT and marijuana. I'm going to talk to you backstage, uh, Heather, to find out what um, IOCDF newsletter those articles are in, but that's a good reminder to please sign up and be a member of the IOCF. You will get a discount at the conference and you'll get the amazing newsletter. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. Liz and I do not take for granted that you come out and support us each week. We absolutely love supporting you. And it's always good seeing your face, Liz. You too, Chris. Okay, see y'all soon. Remember, help and hope are always available. I was like, she better say that. I always wait for that. Goodness, so. I almost missed it today. <laughs> My cue. Take care, everyone. Thanks Bye so much for the kind comments.